And we are golden. So welcome everybody to the Icon of the Month webinar series. Today is August 10th, 2018, and our August icon, I gotta tell you, this dude, he does, the word icon really doesn't even do justice to this man. I'll tell you what, he has dominated the welcome San Diego to voiceover. County. Voiceover speaks description. Uh, yeah, I've got a little bit of a technical issue. Did you hear that or was it just me? Yes, <laughs> we're good. Go ahead, right. sorry. Good. So he's dominated, guys, the San Diego County region for the last four years running. He's been the number one agent. And Kyle, yeah, according to the Wall Street Journal, you're what, number 74? Is that right? Uh, 70 something. It, it... Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kyle, welcome to our webinar today. You there, dude? I, I lost you for a sec. Okay, you're back. All right. Welcome no. to the webinar, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me, dude. I'm super excited. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about you over the years, too, so I'm excited to kind of get on here. I know we're both going to learn a little bit from each other today, and hopefully we can provide some content for everyone who's listening to help them grow their business, help them grow their lives, and, and really just get that full sense of fulfillment in everything that they do. I love it. I love it. And during our pre-interview and our conversations, you said you wanted to share with them some actionable items, things they could literally implement right now, today, and deploy that within their business model to increase their production and profit. Why don't we start there real quick? Let's just give them some, some quick meat and potatoes. What are some things that you would recommend that these realtors do right now to increase their production? Yeah. I am not a big story guy. I don't like telling a whole lot of stories. Um, if you like stories, I'm not your story guy. I'm your guy who's going to tell you how to make more money. Um, that's what I'm all about. I know whenever I listen to these things, that's what I want to know. Um, so that's what I'd love to share, you know, with everybody today. And, and the big thing is a lot of people ask us like, what is it? What's the secret? What do you do different? What makes you so special? Like there's really nothing different or special about me other than the fact that I just implement, you know, I just got back from a four day event um, where it was just massive, massive, massive amounts of content. And what happens is when people go to events like that, a lot of times they write down like 500 things that they're going to do, you know, and what ends up happening is they get stuck in analysis paralysis. They never end up doing anything. So whenever you go to an event or you listen to this, you know, webinar that we're doing right now, you just want to pick one thing, you know, one single thing that you're going to implement. Don't try to implement everything. Don't try to completely change your entire business. Just every time you get, you know, if you go to a conference for a day, pick one thing. If you go to a conference for four days, pick four things that you're going to implement. But people try to, to overdo it and try to do too much. Um, for me, I love using Trello, um, T-R-E-L-L-O. It's a very simple, free system. And you just make three little things for yourself. There's a do, a doing, and a done board super simple. So when you go to a conference, you know, you could put your list of things that you want to do over on one side. And then once you start doing them, move them to the middle. And when they're done, move them to the right. And that visual is very, very effective. And for some of you guys doing that, you know, via a website or an app is more beneficial. Or some of you guys, it's going to be better to do that in your office and just, you know, take a whiteboard, have a cork board, something like that. But you need that visual to know what it is that you want to work on. You need to know what it is that you've been working on and then where you've actually completed because you start to see things move across that board. You start to get that sense of accomplishment. You get that snowball effect. Dave Ramsey talks a lot about that. That snowball effect is so powerful. Um, you know, when you're paying off credit card debts, in theory, the smartest thing to do is to pay off the one with the highest interest rate. But a lot of times the one with the highest interest rate might have the highest balance and it might take you two years to pay that off. But let's say you've got five credit cards and you've got one with a thousand, a twenty thousand dollar bounce. The smartest thing to do is pay that thousand dollar card off first, because you pay that off. Now instead of five credit cards, you're down to four, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm chipping away at this. You start to get rolling, you get that snowball um, rolling down the hill, and you pick up momentum. And before you know it, all five of those credit cards are done. Where if you start the opposite direction and try to take on too much too soon you end up not feeling that sense of accomplishment and then you just kind of fizzle out and give up and quit. So, you know, you don't want to try to do too much. Use a do doing done board, put everything over on the left that you want to do. And then as you start do it, move it across. And when you start to see that done column fill up, you get that sense of accomplishment it actually motivates you and pushes you to do more with it. That's amazing. I'm going to actually implement that. I wrote it down as one of the, um, in coaching one-on-one, -on -one, what we do is we leverage through 
the Google Drive and Google Sheets. It's a really easy way to communicate with our clients. They get to see what I'm typing. I get to see what they're typing. And I'm going to add a tab at the bottom of the sheet that is three columns. Do, yeah. doing, and done. I think that is powerful. Thank you for that, by the way. Good job. Absolutely. All right. So, so what, what advice would you give to an agent who who's really, frankly, they're struggling a little bit. They're, they're having a hard time just making ends meet. What could they do specifically to just increase production and start getting into profit quickly? Yeah, I think the biggest thing a lot of agents lack is just the discipline. Um, they really don't have a schedule. They don't have a calendar. Um, a lot of people get into this industry and they want freedom. And what freedom means is I'm lazy. Like, I don't, I just want to do what I want when I want, whenever I want. Well, that's just not going to fly. I mean, that's how you end up being, you know, the average agent that does three or four deals a year and then is out of the business within five years. Like, that's just not going to work. You really need to treat this like a job. You know, think about any other job out there. There's a set start time, there's a set end time, and there's a set list of tasks that need to be completed between that start and end time. You need to be that same way when it comes to, your real estate business and you need to treat it like a business. And so think about that. What do you do? Do you have a calendar? Do you have things that are set in there that you do every day? And, and once it's in that calendar that you don't deviate from it. So I'll just kind of share our daily schedule with our agents. And then, you know, if that's exactly what you want to do, cool. If you want to tweak it, totally cool. But um, for us, we're really big. Something that I'm a huge fan of is that morning routine. If you've never read Miracle Morning or any kind of book that just talks about how to have a really effective morning, do that. Do yourself a favor because it really, your day starts before you ever get to the office. So for me, I want to turn three things on before I get to the office. That's my mind, my body, and my heart. And so for me, I wake up 4.55 every single day. I jump on something called a 5 a.m. club call. There's an East Coast one, a West Coast one, um, just Google it. And it's a quick little five minute message that is just something that's gonna turn my brain on. It's a thought provoking story, a thought provoking idea that just kind of gets my brain going first thing in the morning. And it typically the goal is to just walk away with one little thing that's gonna you know, get me turned on for the day and think about something that I could implement in my life or something that's just gonna spark some motivation in me. As soon as that's done, I get geared up, Three days a week, I ride my Peloton bike. Um, two days a week, I go to the gym. I like to mix it up. I don't want to do the same thing all five days of the week. So um, I hop on that Peloton bike. Amazing. If you don't have a Peloton, um, they're phenomenal because it's a spin bike that you don't have to go to a spin studio for, but you get the same effect as the spin studio. It's really cool. Um, I'm big on time. Um, savings. So the 15 minutes it would take me to drive to a spin studio and then the 15 minutes to drive back, that's 30 minutes of wasted time. The Peloton saves me 30 minutes every single day. So I love that. Um, so it's either gym or the Peloton bike that gets my body going because now I'm awake. I've, you know, blood's flowing. I'm feeling good. Um, everything's pumping. And then, you know, hop in the shower, get dressed. And then my daughter's typically waking up right around that time. So I get an hour, you know, or so in with her. And then I'm going to work. So the 5 a.m. club call turns my brain, uh, my mind on, my exercise turns my body on, and my, you know, my daughter and my wife turn my heart on. And by the time I show up to the office, I'm so far ahead of everybody else because I'm already alive. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready to rock. I don't need to show up to the office and be like, oh, my God, I'm dragging. I need to go get a Starbucks. Like, that's the worst thing. Like, by the time I show up and I get in there, I strap my headset on. It's like, let's go. Like, I'm super pumped and motivated. So the way that our routine works once we get to the office, um, we do a huddle every day at 815. And that huddle we do via Zoom um, four days a week. We do it once in the office. Uh, I would love to do it in the office every day, but I've got agents who live an hour away from the office, um, our primary office. So it's not really you know, feasible for them to come to that office every single day. So we do four days a week via a Zoom call. Um, when I say a huddle, what does that mean? Um, we initially did our huddle where you would just get on there and talk about how did you do your goal the day before and what's your goal for the, the day to come, which works. But it gets a little monotonous. It gets boring doing the same thing every single day. So we've kind of switched our huddle up. It's 15 minutes on a Zoom call. Monday, we recap how we did the week before. Tuesday, we set our goal for the week to come. Wednesday is when we meet in the office together. And then that's where we're going over the numbers. We're really big on tracking and measuring our numbers. So we're looking at how many dials, how many conversations, how many appointments, how many contracts, and the ratios for all of those and figuring out where is the kink in the hose? Where do we need to unkink? 
um, that host to make sure that the leads are flowing through the system and ultimately coming out the other end. We do that on Wednesdays. Thursdays, we have one of our lenders um, call in and just Okay, so we've got a break in audio. <clears throat> Kyle, can you back up just one second? Thursday, you got a call with your lenders? Yeah, Thursday's a call with our lenders, and the lender is just offering something of value that the agents need to know when it comes to lending. So whether it's a new type of loan that's out or recapping something that's been out there, um, making sure they understand credit repair, FHA, VA, USDA, conventional, all of that stuff. So the lenders do that on Thursdays. And then Fridays, we do uh, an objection handling class. And that's basically them trying to stump me and my sales manager with objections. And what we tell our team is during the week, every time they get an objection that they're not able to overcome, whether it be on the phone, whether it be at an open house, wherever it may be, they need to write that down and bring that on Fridays. So rather than the agents, every time they get stumped calling us, which can totally throw us off our track, they write those things down. And then Friday, it's like, boom, hit us. What's your objections? What are you running into? Where do you need help? So it's more efficient for us. And instead of us having to tell, you know, tell Billy today how to handle the objection and Bobby tomorrow and Mary the next day, we do it in a group environment so everybody can learn from it. Because if you've gotten an objection you got stumped on, somebody else is going to run into that same objection. So we want to make sure that we're all learning from that together. I love it, Kyle. By the way, if you're an individual agent, you don't have a team, well, you could very easily set this up with a group of peers, colleagues, uh, accountability buddies, we like to call them, right? To, to gain those relationships, to help each other grow. And the nice thing about this is you don't have to do it with your competition, meaning you can reach over state lines and find an accountability buddy in California, Utah, whatever the case is. I just encourage you to adopt this type of methodology because there's a couple of things I've heard and I, I don't want them to slip by. First, it sounds like you um, really focus on implementation. Now, I'm a firm believer that the difference between extraordinary success in this industry and like below average results is merely speed of implementation, right? To focus on one thing at a time. You know, a past mentor of mine, past partner of mine said su success is sequential it's not simultaneous. So it's one thing at a time, right? So good job. I love it. Um, breaking up the monotony of the, uh, the daily huddle, making it 15 minutes only, recognizing all work expands to fill the time allowed. I think that's brilliant. In fact, in our office, we had a stand-up meeting for our huddles because, you know, if it, if it goes on so long, you don't want to keep standing. Well, people want to finish that rather quickly, right? <laughs> So good job. I, I love it. So let's keep going. So again, right. if I'm a newer agent or, or somebody who is just lacking production, let's talk about some, some actionable items. Like, let's just say I had a little bit of money and I wanted to spend that. Where would you recommend that I spend that to increase my business? So I'm a huge house fan. If I had $500 to invest, I would not invest in, you know, internet leads or portal leads or anything like that. I would invest in open house leads if I like being belly to belly with people. If I don't like being belly to belly with people, I'd invest in a dialer and expired data. So you gotta know who you are and what you're into. So if you love being on the phone, you love crushing the phones all day long, probably invest in something you know like Mojo and Vulcan 7, right? It's like one of the, a great dialer and a great expired listing source. But if you're not into it, we are really big on doing open houses in our office. So I would spend all of that money buying open house signs and flags, right? Like in A-frames and all of that stuff. Because open houses are, you know, a lot of people like, oh, open house is part of my business. But open house is really the, the center of the wheel for us. And then it's, you know, spokes out to all these other things that we get to do because of the open house. So when we launch a listing, we look at launching a listing a lot like Hollywood looks at launching a movie. You know, they don't decide on Friday, like, oh, today's a good day. Let's drop our new Star Wars movie today. Like, it doesn't work that way, right? They promote it for months and months, if not years in advance of actually dropping that movie. We should do the same thing when we launch our listings. We shouldn't just decide, like, oh, today's a good day. Let's launch our listing, right? Like, there's a buildup to it. And everything builds around a movie premiere. Well, it builds around an open house premiere for us. And so we typically do two open houses the first week, one for the neighbors, one for the public, one's on a Friday night, the other is on a Saturday afternoon. But there's a buildup to these. So whenever we sign a new listing, first thing we do is we shoot exterior twilight photos 
and we have an interior designer go out there and give the seller a list of everything they need to do to get the house ready to go on the market. So the beautiful thing is we've got these exterior photos that we can use to market the home while the seller is getting the home ready to go on the market. Brilliant. Love it. That way we're up on Zillow coming soon. We're running ads on Facebook. All of that stuff is happening while we're preparing the home for sale. So that's a beautiful thing. So we're starting to get some of that pre-marketing that's going. That way the seller's getting everything dialed in inside, following all those recommendations from the interior designer so that when we are ready, we go back, shoot all the photos, and now we execute our listing launch, which starts with Monday, we mail invitations to everybody in the neighborhood. So this is like a formal uh, folded invitation, looks very, very similar to a wedding invitation. I literally took a wedding invitation, sent it to my graphic designer and said, make this look like, make my real estate invites look like this wedding invite. So beautiful card stock, um, full color, looks very, very beautiful. Something that 99% of people have never seen before when it comes to real estate. Like they see it and they're like, wow, this, it comes across like a wedding invite. And they're like, this is fancy. And that's exactly what I want them to think because fancy is what I want them to think of when it comes to us. You know, we want them to think of our marketing as fancy, something that's much nicer than what everybody else does. So those get mailed out on Monday. We're typically mailing to the closest 250 to 500 homes, just depending on the location. Tuesday, we start running social media ads for the open house. So we're running those on um, Facebook. We're running those on um, Instagram. And we're basically hitting the house plus a mile. So everybody within that one mile radius. Wednesday, we drop the listing on the MLS. And then when it hits the MLS, that's obviously when it syndicates out to Zillow, Realtor, Trulia, Redfin, all of that other stuff. So anybody who's searching on any of those websites is going to see the open house. Thursday, we go around the neighborhood and door knock and drop invitations to everybody in the neighborhood. Quick question, Kyle. Um, when you drop it in MLS, it's, uh, it's as though it's not active. It's coming soon or it's active. No showings till Saturday or what, what does that look like? Right. No showings till the open house. So we always want to hold the showings back. The reason for that is one, it's a huge inconvenience for my seller when a listing launches that somebody wants to see it Wednesday at four o'clock, Thursday at 10 o'clock, Thursday at five o'clock, Thursday at seven o'clock. Like that's a nightmare for a seller. Like if you guys have not listed your home for sale and gone through that process, it's terrible. You know, especially if you have pets or kids or anything like that, having to show your house every two hours, like you just don't even want to be home. You're like, screw it. I'm going out of town. Like call me when there's an offer. Like that's the thought that goes through your seller's head. Um, so we make people wait until the first open house for sure. Um, Thursday, we door knock everybody in the neighborhood. If you've ever door knocked before, it could be really, really tough. You'd be shocked how much easier it is to door knock when you're just telling somebody about an open house and inviting them to come and have a glass of wine with you at your open house. Um, we always have the open houses catered. Wine and cheese is always like our safe go-to. We've done sushi and sake, tacos and margaritas. We're doing a barbecue and brew one coming up. Um, so there's always a theme around it. So when I come knock on your door, it's like, hey, my name's Kyle. I wanted to invite you. I probably saw the house we have for sale around the neighbor or around the corner. I wanted to invite you. We're having an open house just for everybody in the neighborhood. It's going to be super fun. We're going to have, you know, great barbecue. We're going to have really good beer there. Should be a blast. I'd love for you guys to come by. And I'll say, oh, okay, cool. And now here's where most agents make the mistake is they're like, all right, well, we'll see you then. Like, no, like don't. The whole point of door knocking is to get into conversation with somebody. Once they open the door, I don't even, the, the open house is just the opener to the conversation. I don't give a damn if they show up to the open house from that point. Like I am door knocking. That is my excuse to door knock to get in conversation with somebody. So once they open the door, I've got what I want, right? I'm talking to this person. I'm belly to belly, which is where I'm personally the most comfortable. Now I get to have that conversation. So yes, I start with the open house line. But then I roll into, you know, who do you look, who do you know who's looking to make a move in the neighborhood? Oh, well, we've been here a long time. We're not going to, okay, do you know anybody who might be looking to move into the neighborhood? You know, you obviously love it here. You've got to have friends who want to live here. No, we don't really know anybody. Okay, well, if you did move, where would you go next? What would it be that takes you there? You know, get into conversation, but the open house is your opener. And then you roll in at that point. So that all happens on Thursday. Friday, we call, text, and email everybody in the neighborhood. So we use Cole, C-O-L-E, for the data. We use Mojo to make the dials, and we use Agent Legend for the text and the email. So then we call, text, email on um, Friday morning. And so we call with Mojo. If we get a hold of them, great. If not, then we're, they're 
once we're done with the dials, then we queue it up in Agent Legend and then that text and emails everybody in the neighborhood. Then we finally do the, the first open house, which is the one for the neighbors. It's on Friday night. Um, we typically do something like five to seven, you know, five to eight, four to seven, something along those lines. It's great right now during the summer, a little harder in the winter time because what I've found with open houses is once the sun goes down, people stop showing up. So when we get into the winter months where the sun is setting at five o'clock, we get rid of the Friday night open house and do it early Saturday morning. So we do like um, 10 to 12 on a Saturday and we bring in like breakfast type stuff. So we bring in like donuts and mimosas and stuff like that. Um, so once we can't do the twilight open house, which what we do is a, a morning open house on a Saturday. Um, when we do the open house, by the time it rolls around on Friday, they've got a call, a text, an email, something at the door, seen it on a portal. They've seen it on social media and they've got something in their mailbox. Like we've hit them seven times already. Then they're driving home. They see our signs all over the place. We're typically doing around 50 signs for an open house. Um, you know, it's huge. You've hit people now eight times, including the signage. That's so powerful. That's a lot of impressions. And the quality of everything that's been put out is top notch as well, which is really important. Um, so when we do these open houses, we run about 50% of the time. We walk away from that open house with a listing appointment. Not even in the follow-up, just people who walk in the door and say, your marketing is amazing. We're looking to sell and we want to hire you. Like we, I used to sell um, audio video stuff. We called those lay downs. Like people just walk in and lay down and just like, yep, I want to sell with you. You're like, Whoop. hallelujah, right? It's a beautiful thing. Um, we do a couple things different at the open house as well. Typically we have three people working it. Um, the person at the door is either one of our ISAs or one of our lenders. And they are strictly working the door. That's their sole responsibility there. Um, and they're standing there with an iPad. I'm not a big fan of paper sign-in sheets. I'm not a big fan of an iPad on a stand. I want somebody personally standing there with it. Um, serves three purposes. One, it's a warm, smiling face when somebody walks in the door. You think about like a Walmart, right? There's literally a position at Walmart called a greeter. And their job is just to greet people as they come in the door because that first impression is a lasting impression. So as soon as somebody walks in the door, it's like, hey, how's it going? Welcome to the open house. Like that's a good first impression where other agents are doing open houses all by themselves. Somebody walks in the door, there's no agent, and they're kind of poking around like, anybody here? Hello, hello. Like that is not the first impression I want when somebody's experiencing one of my open houses because it is an experience. So they're at the door for that reason. Number two, they're having everybody sign in on an iPad and they're handing the iPad. Hi, welcome to the open house. Boom. And they hand them the iPad um, and get them to sign in. Now, if it's somebody who's a little bit older, you know, sometimes they're, they're intimidated by the iPad. We'll just ask them. All right. They're like, Oh, I don't know how to use that. Perfect. I'll take care of it for you. What's your name? Da -da 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 -da. What's your phone number? Da -da -da. Like we'll punch it in for them. We like using Spacio. We used to use Open Home Pro, but we for uh, Spacio, S-P-A-C-I-O. Um, the reason we like their system is that as soon as somebody signs in, it auto imports them into our Boomtown CRM. So I love that. Um, what most agents do is they get the list of everybody and then on Monday morning, then they load everybody up into their CRM and call them. Like we already got them in our CRM as soon as they sign in. And then what's beautiful with Spacio is I can set it up an hour, two hours, three hours after the open house, I can have it automatically follow up with that lead. So that by the time they've left the open house, they get home, boom, they've already got an email in their inbox thanking them for having come by the open house. And I could have a text go out because in Boomtown, I could preset a text. So if somebody comes in from this source, send a text after one hour. So I can automatically trigger my action plans, which is really powerful. Um, third reason I like somebody at the door is it's a security thing, you know? I don't want somebody walking out the door with a laptop, right? Or a TV or something like that. So it's nice for that security factor as well. Um, and then the other thing that they're doing is when somebody walks in the door, um, I typically have myself and one other agent working the open house. And the person at the door is asking one simple question. Do you live in the neighborhood? If yes, send to Kyle. If no, send to whichever agent is with me. All I want are the neighbors. And that way I know those are my potential sellers and I want anybody who's not a neighbor. I want them to go over to whichever agents working it with me, which is one of my buyer's agents, because if they don't live in the neighborhood, they're obviously a potential buyer looking to move into the neighborhood. So um, very simple that that's what the person at the front door will ask them. And then 
it based on the response. They'll say, oh, perfect, let me introduce you to Kyle. And then they'll literally walk them over and introduce me to that person. And then I'll pick up the conversation from there. Um, other little things we do at the open houses, we always have music. Sometimes we have live music, depending on the price point. If not live music, we use, I used to use Bluetooth speakers, but the problem with Bluetooth speakers is if you have a couple of them, they can usually be like 20 feet apart, um, which doesn't work for me, especially if we do like four or 5,000 square foot houses. So we use Sonos speakers now. Um, I typically do one speaker upstairs, one downstairs, and one outside. And then with Sonos, each one can be set at a different volume level too, which is really cool. So downstairs, which tends to be where all the action's happening, I usually have that playing a little louder. Upstairs, there's not as much going on. It could be a little quieter. And then outside, just depending on how much outdoor space there is, I can adjust the volume accordingly. So it just gives you that nice ambiance when you walk in, like, oh, this is fun. Like, this is kind of cool. Where a lot of other open houses, it's just an awkward silence in there. It's not a good experience. So I really want people to have a good experience. Um, that happens Friday night. Saturday is the public open house. And then we start our follow-up on Sundays. So there's already the automated stuff that's gone out, but then we start our calls on Sundays because we know that every other agent starts their calls on Monday. So if everybody else is calling on Monday, we want to call on Sunday. We want to get ahead of the game. So that is how we launch our listings. We really, really like to go all out and it's very meticulous and detailed every step of the way. Kyle, I love it. It's a system, right? You do it the same way every single time to produce a consistent and predictable result. Now, uh, one tweak, Kyle, if I could be so bold, is to offer a suggestion on that open house system. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll always open to it. And, and this is not only for you, everybody who's, who's tuning in right now, and that is to bring your laptop, go down to Office Depot, and just buy a lightweight inkjet printer. Guys, they're on sale for $47. See, the challenge in doing an open house is that See, buyers look at properties they can't afford. Would you agree? And, you know, uh, if you're showing only one open house, well, then the opportunity to schedule an appointment with that buyer, well, it diminishes significantly the moment they leave that open house. Now, when you have your laptop and you have a portable printer, you could ask them a few questions. Like, let's say you're Kyle, Kyle's buyer specialist and you're pushed over here because you're not a neighborhood homeowner. And you'd ask a few questions like, tell me, how does this home compare to some of the others you've seen? On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being excellent and one being poor, how would you rate this home? Now, what would it take to bring that to a 10? They say, oh, we need a bigger kitchen, we need a bigger backyard. Uh, interesting, and in the, in the sign-in process through your system called Spacio, does it ask price range that they're comfortable with and all of that? Um, you can custom program your questions. So we're more concerned with getting their info and how they found out about the open house because I'm really big on tracking sources. All right. Well, finding out their price point, obviously, let's say you're holding a home open that's, I don't know, a half million dollars. They can qualify up to 400000 You know, at that point, you're pretty much dead in the water and you're stuck in the follow-up game. Isn't that right, Kyle? And even though you're doing Absolutely. it for others, what my input to you would be to strike while the iron's hot. See, I think the realtor that's going to earn this person's business is the one that can fulfill the needs of that prospect quickly, effectively. So when you find out they're looking up to 400000 they can't afford this house, you just invite them to sit down at the table with you just for a couple of minutes. And in a matter of moments, you'll be able to print off a list of every property that matches their unique criteria. Now, once you do that and you collect the data, you're inputting it into the MLS platform, you click the how many button, and let's say there's seven listings currently active. Well, you print them off, you teach them how to read the MLS sheets. As you go through that, you say we've got one goal, and it's really simple. Let's create an A list of properties and a B list of properties. A list means these are the ones you wanna see the inside of. B list means they're not right for one reason or another. Right now, once you've positioned yourself to possess something that the prospect wants, and Kyle, I know you'll agree, it's easy to set an appointment right then and there, isn't it? So they've got yeah. two out of the seven they want to see the inside of. Guys, it's simple. Right? It's super simple. So if you'll take that tweak and track your results, Kyle, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, one thing we're big on too is when we are at these open houses, we do always try to set the appointment on the spot. And I will literally tell somebody, hey, pull your phone out, grab, load up your calendar. I'll load my calendar up right there on the spot. I'm like, hey, mornings in my script whenever I'm setting appointments are mornings, afternoons, or weekends best for you. I always ask them that. That way they feel as though there's a choice. I know a lot of other people go a different route and say, I've got Tuesday at five or Wednesday at six. I'm not a huge fan personally of going straight to that. What I do is ask, are mornings, afternoons, or weekends best for you? 
and then I give them those two choices. Awesome. But I like to give them some feeling of choice and then go down that route. Because otherwise, if I say I got this or this and neither one of those work, now I'm backpedaling. Now I'm getting into an awkward spot. But if they tell me mornings are best, then I look in my calendar and say, okay, perfect. I've got Monday morning at eight or I've got Wednesday morning at nine. Which one's better? Because they already told me mornings are best. So therefore, I have a higher probability that one of those two times is going to work. Whereas if I came right out of the gate and said I got Monday at eight or Wednesday at nine, and they're like, well, I work from eight to five, Monday to Friday, I'm screwed, right? Like now I'm like, oh, oh, uh, well, what about this time? Well, what about, like, it gets awkward. So, but we literally book it right there on the spot. And I'll say, hey, I know you probably signed in, but give me your email and your phone number again, just in case. And I'll invite them to the calendar event right then and there. I'll throw their phone number in the calendar event. Like I'm really, really big on booking the appointment on the spot. And then making sure that they give me their email and phone number. I don't care if they gave it, you know, at the front just in case they gave bad info. I'm getting that info again. So I'm never going to be like, oh, yeah, you signed in. I'll, I'll just follow up there. Like, no. Now, here's my phone. Load it up. Smart. And uh, by getting them to load their calendar and you with yours right then and there, I mean, it's very intentional. Brilliant. Good job. Great tweak. Love it. Love it. So rather than investing this $500, let's say, into Zillow ad spend or something like that, to do something that's actually going to produce massive dividends. Now, a couple of things you said. First, 50 signs per open house, guys. Recognize you get out of things what you put into things, right? By making this a grand event to the neighborhood, well, it turns into a kind of a neighborhood party, right? And getting those yeah. people to show up and have those conversations, God, that's powerful. Way to go, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, the you. greatest compliment I can get is somebody complaining about how many signs I put up. Like, I love that. Like, God, did you guys put enough signs up? And I just say, thank you. I literally just respond with thank you because they know <laughs> when they go to sell their house, they want signs up for their open house. Dude, I love it. I absolutely love it. Good, good. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about... Um, how you're leveraging video to increase your brand awareness, create that powerful omnipresent brand in San Diego County, because let's face it, there's a ton of noise out there right now. Um, how is it that you're standing out? How is it that you were voted the number one video influencer from bomb bomb? What are you doing? Talk to us about that. So first, the important thing to understand is why video. And there's, there's really, two reasons. One video rules the world. Um, the recent statistics is that, by 2019, 80% of the content we consume is gonna be consumed via video. Okay guys, it's 2018. Like 2019 is a matter of months away at this point. So if you scroll through your Facebook feed even today or your Instagram feed, you're gonna see that the majority of the content you're consuming already, it's over 50% already. You know, and we're gonna be at that 80% next year. So we know that's the content people are consuming. They, um, YouTube also came out that there's 3.3 billion hours of footage being watched on YouTube every single day. Um, at the conference I was just at, they even came out with a stat that there's more video being watched on YouTube than all cable companies combined across the world. Wow. So there's more eyeballs on YouTube than on cable TV right now. Like you need to take advantage of putting video out there. The third reason and the most important reason is the, the reason you wanna do video is it gives you the ability to have people know you, like you and trust you before they ever even meet you. That is massively powerful because when I go do one of those open houses and somebody walks in the door and they've seen my video content, we're instantly in rapport. I don't have to win them over and use scripts and dialogues and all of that stuff. They come in like, oh, I've seen your videos. I love what you guys do. They're putty in your hands at that point because they already know you like you trust you, which are the three things you need out of somebody before they're gonna do business with you. So those are the reasons why to do video. Yeah. As so far as uh, what? In psychology, it's called a, a parasocial relationship, meaning you're putting it out there. This person is unknowing to you and frankly, kind of unknowing to them. They're forming a relationship with you. There's an, a familiarity. And again, it's called parasocial. And when you're leveraging video appropriately, you'll be able to create that relationship. And you don't even know you've done it, which is really powerful, right? Totally. So it's when it comes to video, the... most is people like what camera do you use what lens what microphone um they ask what software do you edit with they ask all these questions like and then i'll follow up how many videos have you shot oh i'm just getting started but what are you worried about buying a five thousand dollar camera for if you've never even shot a damn video like that's it that's that is the 
only camera you need. That's the only lens you need. It's the only microphone you need. It's the only editing software that you need. People are so obsessed with all that stuff that none of that matters. I talk about the four C's of video and these are in order of importance. Number one is content. Number two, consistency. Number three are the channels. And number four is the composition. But everybody ask about the composition first. They ask, how do you put your videos together? Blah, blah, blah. Like, quit, guys. None of that matters. Content is the most important thing by a freaking mile. All the other stuff, you know, comes next. You could make, you could have a $50,000 red camera and, and do all this amazing stuff with these lenses and lighting. But if the content sucks, nobody's going to watch it. It does not, it's not about the quality or the composition of the video. It's all about the content. Because if you do a really good video that's got amazing content and you shot it with, you know, an iPhone one, you're still going to get a lot of traction on it because it's about the content. So I want people to be focused on content first. Don't worry about the camera, the lens, the microphone, or the editing software. That doesn't matter. It's all about the content. Be obsessed with your content. That is the most important thing that you can do is focus on that. Um, the, the things that I see most agents do when they finally do start doing videos is they do a lot of like property walkthroughs and the biggest mistake I see them make when it comes to those is they just do like, I am standing in front of one, two, three main street. It's three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 1500 square feet. It's listed for 700,000. It's like you dumbass, they can read. Like they have all of that information already. Like you need to tell them something they don't know. Like tell them about the history of the home. Tell them about the history of the neighborhood. Tell them about what, you know, is around them. What's the lifestyle going to be like when they live there that they can go walk to this cool coffee shop. And on Tuesday nights, they have open mic night and Wednesdays, they have a band playing there. Tell them about the movies that they have at the park. That's right around the corner. Talk about all of that stuff. That's what you need to talk about in the videos. Tell them something fun. Tell them something that's going to actually, you know, get them engaged and be yourself. Um, far too many people try to emulate others that they see. Don't be yourself. It's okay. 50% of people are going to love you. 50% of people are going to hate you. Our political system is a perfect example of that. I mean, it's damn, they're split right down the middle. I don't care if you're red or blue, right? 50% of you hate whoever's the Republican and 50% of you hate whoever's the Democrat. Like it's just automatic. That's how our society is. So no matter what, 50% of people are, are not going to like you. Just accept it, deal with it. It's never gonna be 100%. What you wanna focus on is the 50% of people that do like you, and you want them to like you for being you. So you need to be authentic to who you are. Don't try to be somebody else. So don't you know do a video and be in a full suit and tie, and then somebody comes to meet with you and you're in board shorts, flip flops, and a Hawaiian shirt, right? You know, you need to stay true to who you are and you need to talk the same way that you talk. You know, I call clients dude, like, cause that's how it's what I'm going to call them when I see them. Like I say, dude, in a video, um, you know, or I might even cuss from time to time. Like it's okay. Like that's who I am because what they see on the video is who they're going to get when they, you know, when I open the door for them. So stay true to who you are. I think it's really, really important and there's no right or wrong. The only right is staying true to who you are. The only wrong is pretending to be somebody that you're not. Love it. Love it. So let's talk a little bit more about content. And uh, yeah. since that is king, there's no question in my mind about that. You know, just clogging up people's news feeds with uh, pictures of houses and videos of houses that they're not going to buy, I don't think that's enough to get the traction as it relates to branding. Agreed? So tell me, Kyle, Agreed. what are some of the other things that you're doing that involve the social aspects of social media marketing? And I love what you said about the home tour, right? It's not about how many bedrooms and bathrooms it has. You've got to engage the social aspect of it to talk about, you know, the, the park, the, the coffee shop, the open mic night, all of those things, critically important to, to combine what it is that you do with some social aspect of the business, the neighborhood, something like that. So tell us some more about content. I'm curious. Yeah. So the big thing that we've really, that really put us on the map is doing videos where we interview local business owners. Um, Gary V, I, I don't remember if he came out with the first or we did, but um, going around and interviewing all the business owners, particular communities. So we came out with the first series called Santee Saturdays, which accomplishes the second part of this whole thing, which is not just the content, 
but also the consistency. Because if you come out with a series called Santee Saturdays, you've got to come out with content every Saturday that people want to see. So by giving them something, by interviewing a local business owner, we're giving them content they care about. We're telling them about the coffee shop and that's where they're learning about the open mic night and the bands that play and all of that stuff. So we're giving them good content they care about and we're doing it consistently on a weekly basis. This okay. stuff's been so popular. That it's, it's, what is it? So the, the main community I personally live in is called Santee, S-A-N-T-E-E. Okay. Santee Saturdays. Um, and so we interviewed every business owner across the city. We did the yoga studio. We did the CPA, the insurance guy, the chiropractor, the coffee shop. I mean, everything. Right? We interviewed every business owner in the community. We did 100 episodes of the show. And it accomplished a lot because, one, I gave my community content they actually cared about 100 straight weeks. You know, show them all of these cool businesses around town that they maybe didn't know about. Or maybe they knew about them and they were so proud because it's their friend's business or it's the place they, you know, go to the, to see the chiropractor, whatever the case may be. So we gave people really good content that they cared about so much so that they literally nominated me for person of the year for the entire city. Like that's pretty rad. And it's by and large those videos that we do because we're giving people content they care about. I'm not getting up week after week telling them about the three bedroom, two bath home that's 1500 square feet. I'm getting up telling them about all the cool stuff there is in the community. So it really built me as a neighborhood expert and it gave my community stuff they actually cared about. And then number two, I got relationships with a hundred business owners around my community which are all the people that you want to have a relationship with, right? The business owners tend to have the most money and have the most connections. And so those relationships are really valuable. And the best result I got out of that was a $4 million listing with the owner of one of those businesses that we interview. And it was not the most exciting video. It was like a senior community. Like you would never be like, Oh, this is going to be the best video. It's going to get a million <laughs> views. Like, no, it, it probably had the lowest, one of the lowest view counts of all the videos we did. But I got a relationship with somebody who was very influential. And now I've actually become friends with this guy and he develops tons and tons of homes all over the city. Um, you know, so don't get too focused. I was very fortunate. I got to have dinner with Gary V and Tom Ferry um, last year, actually earlier this year. And that was a big thing Gary talked about too, was that don't focus on your view count. It's not all about view count um, or likes or comments. It's about putting out good quality content because you only need that one person that watches that video or the one person who's the person you're on the video. You only need that one relationship. So just cause a video doesn't get, you know, 10,000 views doesn't mean it's a bad video. Um, so that's something that was really big too. Gotcha. Very good. Um, so by the way, at Icon Coaching in coordination with my friend Grant Weiss at real estate marketing university, we developed a 52 week video content guide that if you simply followed this, and it's essentially what Kyle is talking about, to do this every week posting a video about something in the community, it is a content guide that if you followed it week by week by week, it's as though, and Kyle will tell you, it's like you're the mayor of the town. You've, you've elevated to some celebrity type status. Now, a couple of things I wanna say about this. First, that business owner, you're gonna tag them, they're gonna share it with all of their social connections. They're, give them the MP4 video, they'll send it out in their e-newsletter, they'll, send, they'll email it out to people. Their employees will share it on their social. And here's the point, the only way that that business owner can repay you for helping them gain brand awareness is to refer you and your services, right? So that's exactly. brilliant, yeah. that's brilliant, and with I love it. With the business owners, We've done business with friends of theirs. I just listed an $800,000 property last week from a guy that owns the yoga studio. And he's going to buy a six or $700,000 property. You're talking a million and a half dollars worth of transactions because I got in relationship with him because we did a video about his business. That is so cool. So cool. Well, you're proof to that, that methodology. So um, first is content. Second, consistency and doing it every Saturday. Let me ask, do you do this Facebook live? Do you record it and then upload it? Oh, how does this work? We do both. We record it and do a very polished version of it, but we also shoot a Facebook live while we're there. Um, and our show, we finished Santee Saturdays. This is a 55,000 person community. We did a hundred episodes. We kind of ran out of businesses. So we <laughs> a little over a year ago um, when we looked back at all the content we saw that the restaurants always did the best time and time again restaurants had the most engagement so we expanded to not just the city of Santee but the surrounding cities 
Um, so from a 50,000 person city to a 250,000 person region, um, which is the East County part of San Diego. And so now it's called East County Eats. So East County Eats. Um, and so everything goes on there. It's all restaurants now. So we put out a polished video of every restaurant. Um, and then we also do a Facebook live video while we're there. And what's funny is the polished videos are getting like 10 to 30,000 views a week. <laughs> Book lives are getting like three to 5,000 views a week. And so Facebook live, you don't have to like, we have two videographers and all that. Um, you don't need to do all of that. Like it can just be Facebook live period. It's 5,000 views a week without having to spend any money. It's pretty cool. You can do it on a damn selfie stick or a tripod. Like you don't have to have a videographer like we do. Don't overthink it. You're again, like you said, this cell phone. Um, so you could totally do it just with Facebook live. One of the big lessons we learned is you want to have it on its own page. The first series we did Santee Saturdays, we did it on our, um, on our whistle realty group page. And you know, it's hard to get people to like a real estate page because they're concerned if I like this real estate page, I'm going to get force fed real estate content. So when we started East County Eats, we did it on its own Facebook page, its own Instagram, its own everything. On Facebook, we've got like 19,000 likes on it where the Whistle Realty page has like 6,000. Wow. So people are much more willing to like a page that doesn't talk about real estate in the title. Now, could you weave some real estate content in there? Of course, especially if you're giving content, you're jabbing, as Gary says, you can then you can write hook. Um, so that was a big learning lesson for us, too, is it's best to have your community page be its own separate page. Don't put all that community content on your real estate page. Now, of course, you could share it from the East County Eats page and put it onto the Whistle Realty page, but it needs to have its own page. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Now, during these videos, during these interviews, you're not talking about real estate really at all. You're just introducing yourself. You know, I'm Kyle Whistle with the Whistle Realty Group, right? And I'm here to interview yep. sessions. And that's probably about the only bit of information that you're talking about real estate, right? Absolutely. So yeah, you don't want to get on there in real estate, real estate, and just barf real estate all over them. Um, you just want, you know, I want to make sure they know I'm in real estate. Actually, at the conference I was just at, I had somebody talk crap about me saying I'm a realtor at the front of the video. But I was like, if you don't tell them you're a realtor, how the hell are they ever going to know? Like, don't be a secret agent. Like you're giving them massive content. It's okay to tell people you're a realtor because uh, you don't tell them they're not going to know. I'm not going to wait for them to find out. I don't want to just be the guy in the videos. I want to be the real estate guy in the videos that talks about restaurants. Um, but yeah, outside of that intro mentioning that, Hey, I'm as a realtor, I'm always out trying restaurants. I want to share my favorite restaurants with you. And then it's, I'm Kyle Whistle with Whistle Realty Group. And then boom, we roll into the content. Um, but another quick thing on that is if you watch one of our videos, we don't start with me. Um, people don't want to see my face. They don't want to see your face talking first thing. And they sure as hell don't want to see your logo first thing. So when you're doing a video, give them a little taste of what they're going to see, right? So like we do a lot of food stuff. The first thing they see is going to be video spinning on a cool little plate with bright colors and it's sexy. Because when they're scrolling through Facebook with their thumb and they see that, that, that'll get them to stop scrolling. But if they're scrolling and they see your logo, you know, and the bumper is what we refer to it, first thing they see is the bumper, they're just going to keep scrolling right through. They're like, oh, it's a real estate thing. Ah. But if they see this really delicious looking pizza, they're going to stop for a second and see what it's all about. So um, always when you're doing video, make sure that you start with some content. Then you can have your intro bumper, then go back to content. But do not start with your um, bumper with your logo and stuff like that. It's a huge mistake I see people making video. Right on. Okay, so we go content, consistency, and then you go into channels. Tell me about that. Which channels, which cultures do you guys channels. do? Um, Facebook's our best friend. We love Facebook. Everything starts in Facebook. But you can you know, repurpose this in a lot of different places. So um, we'll do the, the long video, right, that's like – three to five minutes long, but then we make a ton of short videos out of that. So then we'll make little one minute teaser videos that drive people to the longer videos. Um, every single video we do always ends up on YouTube. Um, even Facebook Live, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you're done with a Facebook Live, you can save that video and then upload it to YouTube. Like don't let your Facebook Lives die in Facebook save them and then put them into YouTube and then they can live on forever because once you get stuff in YouTube, YouTube's very searchable. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you type in 
um, burger joint in Santee, maybe one of the burger interviews we did will show up on the first page of Google. The YouTube video will show up there. So you need to make sure every video you do gets on YouTube. Always everything in YouTube. Make sure to optimize it too. So make sure your title, your description, your tags, everything is in alignment and is very searchable because um, you know we're growing our subscriber audience is growing like a thousand subscribers or I'm sorry, a hundred subscribers a month right now on YouTube. And every single time we drop a video, these people are getting notified. Like that's powerful. Um, so don't discount YouTube. Don't just focus on social, take those videos you put on social and put them on YouTube as well. Um, and then we're doing again, little short videos. Those are going on Instagram. Those are going on Facebook kind of teasers to drive people to the longer videos. Um, so YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, those are the three that we really, really focus on heavily. Good, good. And if I think you'd give them the advice just to focus on one at first, right? Yeah, don't try to do too much. I see people like, oh, I put it on Snapchat, I put it on Twitter, I put it on Insta, I put it on LinkedIn, I put it like, unless you have a full-time person doing all that, don't. Just Facebook is, you know, ideal and or Instagram, but everything goes on YouTube. Like YouTube is the one that everything has to make it onto because when I do a rad video of one of these restaurants, I've seen at least a dozen of them take that video and embed it on the front page of their website. So now when somebody finds that restaurant, they're going to see a video and I'm getting branding out of it, right? Because I'm getting branded by the restaurant now, right? So people, when they go to that restaurant are getting introduced to me, my business and my show because the restaurant owner liked his, the video so much, they chose to embed it on their website. So that's powerful. I love it. So gang, it's a longer tail approach, yet uh, I promise you that when you do this, the, the pipeline will fill up over a period of time, right? It's about content. It's about consistency. It's about, uh, excuse me, um, channels and yeah. then opposition. So all you need is your phone. Don't really need anything else until you get to the point that you really want to scale this, right? Exactly. I love it. Good, good. So gang, we've got a couple of minutes left. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Go to the chat section, type in the questions that you have for Kyle. It could be anything from his organizational structure to compensation models, whatever it is you'd like to hear from him, let's talk about it now. So as we're waiting for them to do that, Kyle, tell me, tell me a little bit more about your team. How many people are on the team? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, we've, we've grown massively. We sold 374 houses last year, 205 million. Um, we've already sold 250 houses this year. We're huge. Um, so we're running anywhere, you know, it's always changing, but we're running between 20 and 25 agents and we've got 10 people on payroll. So payroll, I have an operations manager, very techie, builds all of our systems and connects everything and builds me Google forms and dashboards and all of that stuff. So I know everything that's happening with my business. I've got a sales manager. He's the one who's doing the coaching. I am not the best coach. When somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, my brain doesn't understand why they didn't do it. Um, I, just, I can't comprehend it. So I'm not a good coach. So I have, um, somebody who's got four kids and has been a coach of, um, MMA and a personal trainer and coaches wrestling. He's a great coach. Um, I have a finance manager, so I own real estate. I own an escrow company. I flip houses. I own rental properties. I run a nonprofit. Like my, she runs my entire financial life. Um, I have a listing manager so that when I sign a listing, I just give her the contract. She takes care of everything. Two transaction managers. And I have two media and marketing managers. So they do all of our photo, all of our video and our social media. And then I have an assistant. And then we always have ISAs coming and going. So right now we have three ISAs. Three ISAs. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about your ISAs. Is it the traditional sense of an ISA as an inbound sales associate? So they're following up with leads, they're fielding incoming calls, things like that. Or are they being proactive in making outbound calls to expireds for sale by owners, circle prospecting, things like that? Both. Um, so they do both. So typical day when they come in, they're starting out hitting expireds, FISBOs, canceled. Then they're doing lead follow-up in the middle of the day. And then they're hitting those expired FISBOs and canceled again at the end of the day. Nice. So it's, it's definitely mixed. Um, our, the way that we run it is to join my team, you have to start as an ISA. So we make anybody who wants to join the team put in 90 days minimum as an ISA. That is how you earn a spot on my team. So it's a combination of, uh, for me, I look at it as kind of a boot camp. I got to see if you've got what it takes before I bring you on the team. So you're kind of auditioning in that role. For them, I mean, it's 90 days where they, and it's paid, they're getting paid training. So they're learning all of our systems. 
They're getting to shadow me and the other agents on the team and appointments. And they're learning the foundation of this business, which is prospecting and lead follow-up, which are the two most important things, whether you're brand new in the business or you've been in the business for a hundred years. Um, so we're building a nice solid foundation for these guys before we bring them onto the team. And usually program and 50% don't. Um, and I'm okay with that because I don't, it's not for everybody. Some people, um, you know, we'll put their 90 days in and they suck and we'll cut them. Um, and some people will be amazing and we'll move them up before 90 days hits. Um, and some people give up because they just like, I can't make calls. Well, probably not going to be a good fit for our team. Not that you can't be good in real estate, but our team is very phone heavy. So we want to make sure that these guys are comfortable on the phone and let's figure that out in the first 90 days. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I've got some, uh, some questions coming in and which by the way, the icon methodology, very similar. We recommend that you hire people that are going to be sales agents on your team in that ISA or OSA role because we want to make sure that number one, they got tenacity. Number two, 90% of their success in this business, guys, well, it's going to be determined by their ability to get on the phone, to establish rapport and close for appointments. So forcing them to do that, whether it be 90 days or if you have a benchmark, you have to bring in five listings to the team or 10 listings to the team or whatever the case is, to position them for success. See, most realtors don't like to lead generate. We know this for a fact. And so they, they want to delegate that. And I don't blame you. Now, here's the good news. Lead generation can be leveraged appropriately, and Kyle will tell you that it's possible. The bad news is, well, you get to manage it first. You get to master it first, and then you get to train people. Because what most people do is they say, I don't like doing this. I'm going to hire somebody. And they say, well, here's maybe some things you should know. Now go conquer the world. And unfortunately, the people fail miserably, right? Rather, by training them appropriately and bringing them up through the organization, you set them up for success. Great job. All right, so we do have... Um, a technical question. What mic is best for uh, to use when doing videos? He says he's doing videos and the biggest complaint it, of his videos is that the sound quality is lousy. This is the only mic you need. Just be conscious of, the, of your surroundings. So if you're shooting something outside, don't stand on the busy street. Find somewhere that's going to be shielded from the sound. I mean, it's, it's simple to just to think about those things. If you're in a room that has uh, like that you can buy like a crate kind of stuff to put around the walls to kind of deaden some of that sound and absorb it um when we shoot though we're using lav mics so it's just a little mic that clips on up here and it records to mp3 if you buy the ones that are wireless and connected they're so damn expensive so you can buy them um i don't remember the brand name of them i'm sorry but they shouldn't don't spend more than a hundred bucks it's a simple lav mic that connects to your pocket with an mp3 recording of it and then when you go to edit that you can sync that up with the video it's really easy and they also have a, a wired lav mic i think it's like 25 dollars. it plugs right into the base of your phone it's got a cord now the cord is about 15 feet long yet you strap it on and it, it does improve sound quality no doubt Okay, as a single agent growing business, growing a business, excuse me, who would you hire first? Assistant. An assistant. I've never worked a day in my life without an assistant. I don't understand how to work without an assistant. Um, think about everything that you do on a daily basis and you should value your time at a minimum of $100 an hour. So every single thing that you do, think about is this something that I could hire someone to do for 15 bucks an hour or is this $100 an hour work? you're going to realize that 90% of what you're doing is $15 an hour assistant work. you got to let that go. Let an assistant do that stuff for you so you can focus on the $100 an hour work. Um, and you'll find an assistant is the best accountability partner in the world because now you've got to pay them and you will work your ass off to make sure that you pay them and you'll put food on their table before you put food on your table. As a result, you'll work significantly harder. So you've got to have an assistant. If you are listening to this and you do not have an assistant, that is the first hire that you should make. You should do that as soon as you're done. You've got to have an assistant um, because you're spending way too much time on non-income generating activities. Love it. Love it. And by the way, if it's um, maybe you don't have the budget for it, I mean, even an hour a day, right? Somebody that you can delegate to, I think is appropriate. Okay, Eric Daly, one of our one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Uh, he said, when starting out, how did you convince a solo agent about the benefits of joining your team? So you need to be able to clearly articulate the value of your team. Um, something that I did, I took the time to go in and look at every single benefit that we provide to our team members and attributed value to each of those things. So that if they were to go and try to 
create those exact same things on their own, what would it cost them to do that? And by the time we are done, it's almost a hundred things that we provide. And if they were to go recreate it, it would cost them in excess of a hundred thousand dollars to recreate everything that we have created for them. So when I can take that list and show it to them and they could be like, holy shit, there's no way I can do all of that. It's a very easy decision form at that point. So, but you've got to know your value proposition and you've got to be able to articulate it. And that's my personal choice of how to articulate it. Yeah. And, and Eric, one thing I know about you is that you are mastering your, your Facebook ad strategy with the geo-targeting, getting seller leads, buyer leads. And I would leverage that knowledge, that education that you've paid for um, to engage, encourage them to engage with you, to align with you and accomplish the vision. Plus, I think you've got to have a vision, a vision large enough to encapsulate their personal vision. They've got to be able to see a really bright future in what it is that you're doing and a, and a compelling reason why they want to align with you. So great job, Kyle. I've had a blast with you, buddy. As you know, I'm going to be out there with my team in San Diego coming up here in just a few weeks. And buddy, we're going to stop by your office. We're going to bring a video camera. I'm going to make it available to all of you, provided Kyle allows me to. I'm going to give you the opportunity to kind of see an inside peek, uh, behind the scenes peek in, in Kyle's operation. We're going to inv interview all of his people. We're going to look at his scripts, dialogues. We're going to take a look at his technology, how he's leveraging that, and uh, really report back to you guys some of the proven best practices. So you too can become an icon. Kyle, really appreciate the time, buddy. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today and adding such significant value to all of our followers. So good job, everybody. And thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, man. And those that had other questions didn't get answered. Um, we have a Facebook group where we just help agents, um, thewhistleway.com. You can ask those questions in there. We're more than happy just to answer those. We just, that's our group where all we do is jab, just provide info help people grow their business. We find that the more we put into this ecosystem of real estate, the more it's going to uh, spit out there for us. So if you guys have questions that didn't get answered, feel free to ask them in there and we'll make sure to get you guys answers. I love it, Kyle. Good job. So again, it's Whistle Way. Now, if they have a referral for your part of San Diego County, how would they get in touch with you? Is it through that Whistle Way? Yeah, that's the best way. I'm capped out on Facebook. I haven't been able to add anybody for years now. So um, join, just connect with us on the Whistle Way or on Instagram is even better for me. All right. So once again, guys, this is recorded. I, I see that popping in here a couple, couple of times that you missed maybe the front side of this. It is recorded. We will send a replay link. I appreciate you being here live here. So, so, and do that every single time we do this because it does give you an opportunity to ask questions and drill down on certain topic and subject matter. So way to go, everybody. Until we get to talk again next time, be on purpose, be productive, and all, as always, be powerful. Thanks again, Kyle. Talk to you soon, buddy. Thanks so much.